And in these times, in these times of real stress, even in these times, during these challenging times, these difficult times, in these times of COVID-19, in these times has been a handy turn of phrase in 2020, with varying adjectives used to modify it. Difficult, unique, strange. What started as a useful shorthand for the COVID-19 pandemic became used to describe worldwide protests and calls for racial justice. This fall, the Omnia podcast goes beyond the shorthand, using COVID-19 as a platform for a six-episode series that explores the science, social science, and history that has shaped events in 2020. In these times, knowledge is more important than ever. Today, we talk to a political scientist, a historian, and an environmental humanist about the other urgent issues of our time and examine how they affect and are affected by COVID-19. This is episode three, Crisis Upon Crisis. What do you make of the president's handling so far of the coronavirus? I remember the swine flu, the bird flu, Y2K, and all of those things were so hyped up in the media and they turned out to be what he refers to as a nothing burger. So I think this is also going to be a big nothing burger. If we can slow the spread, we can buy days. And when we buy those days, that means that we can get ventilators and we can get beds and kits and masks and tests. And this will save lives. USA! USA! We don't want your shutdown anymore! It's a little shocking to see so many people not wearing protective masks, not staying six feet apart. Since the early days of the pandemic in the U.S., our approach has been affected by politics. Democrats and Republicans have each taken stands on the best way to react that extend even to how they interpret the emerging science. Political science professor Matthew Lewandowski studies political polarization. I think for a lot of people, for the first time they kind of popped into the kind of broader discourse was around the 2000 election, you know, which for, for those who remember it, you know, was so close and it had that kind of stark red-blue map where aside from the kind of area of the old industrial heartland, right, it was basically the coast where Democratic and the middle of the country was, you know, more Republican. Um, and so that generated a lot of interest around trying to understand um, these issues. So it's something I, I've been working on now for a long time. And so I think for political scientists, we tend to, to think that the um, elites are quite divided. And so when we say elites, we basically just mean kind of elected officials who make decisions, right? So you know, when we look at the positions that say, you know, Nancy Pelosi and Joe Biden and Chuck Schumer on the one hand and Mitch McConnell and Ted Cruz and Donald Trump on the other hand take, they're quite distinct. Professor Lewandowski, who is also Penny and Robert A. Fox Director of Fells Institute of Government at Penn, says that the increased polarization has its roots in the 1950s and 60s, when the parties realigned. Now people's political alignment has become so intense that it influences how they view the coronavirus and the measures taken to deal with it. So one of the, the things that political scientists always like to, to think about with regards to these sort of issues is that ordinary people take their cues from political elites. And so I don't mean that people are stupid and they don't think for themselves, but you know, on an issue you don't know a lot about, like say what to do about a pandemic, you look at people who you kind of trust to give you information. And so if you're a Democrat, right, those people are likely to be Democrats, right? If you're a Republican, those people are likely to be Republicans. And so you could imagine a very different world. And, and this is sort of what happened to a lot of other countries uh, where all the national leaders would have gathered uh, the president, vice president, key leaders of the House and Senate in January when they began getting reports that this virus was spreading, right? And said, so, okay, we need to band together. We need a national strategy. We're going to come together as one and do this. It's not going to be a political issue. We're going to figure out how to solve this together. But the divide among regular citizens is not as large as it might seem. But that said, I think it's also important to note that there are there gaps between Democrats and Republicans in how they view the pandemic, right? What kinds of protective behavior they're engaging in? Absolutely. 
But there's two points to note there. One is that they're somewhat smaller than you might think. Right. And that for a lot of people, they don't necessarily view this through a partisan lens. Right. Journalists, political scientists, politicians, we tend to see the world through an extremely political lens because that's our focus. That's what we think about. We sometimes make a mistake in that ordinary people just aren't as politically wrapped up as we are. The people who are most polarized in their approach to the pandemic also tend to be those who view the world through a strong political lens. And these are the people we hear most about. Why do we hear so much about those people? Well, one of the things we also know from a lot of scholarship and political science and communications is that those people are the, you know, quote unquote, loudest voices in the room. Right. So those are the people we see on Twitter or on Facebook or Instagram kind of filling up our feeds with all kinds of things, either saying like you're a horrible person if you don't wear a mask or um, you're a sheep if you wear a mask. Right. Or these are the sorts of people who have very strong opinions and love to you know go to rallies and speak to reporters. Right. And journalists like to cover those people because they're exciting and their statements will be full of conflict. If you interview someone and they say like, well, you know, I really see both sides. I think, you know, there's reasonable arguments. Uh, I'm going to wear a mask, but, you know, I think we should also be thoughtful about how we, you know, approach the problem, right? That's not a super interesting story. It's much more interesting to have something where the issue is framed in much more kind of stark conflict-driven terms. Levandusky thinks about how when he was a kid, People got their news from only a few sources, the major television networks, radio, and local newspapers. For people who like news, there's never been a better time. But that abundance comes with some side effects. You can read a thousand news websites. You can look at Twitter. You can look at Facebook. You can subscribe to podcasts, right? You can watch MSNBC, CNN, you know, Fox News. You can get Al Jazeera English, right? You can get so many different types of news. But at the same time, if you don't like news, you don't really have to get it. So how is any given outlet going to compete for your attention? Well, they've got to make the story really interesting. So one way they can do that is they can kind of play up its most sensationalistic elements and they can play up the most novel elements of it to kind of keep you coming back. That means they tend to kind of overhype certain types of things and kind of want to give the most compelling version um, of a story. In the time of COVID-19, the media we consume has a big impact on our understanding of the virus and its effects. I've been doing some survey work this spring and we're, you know, seeing each time we go back to folks, more and more people have either had themselves, know someone who's had it, know someone who's been very sick from it as the um, pandemic, you know, kind of spreads. But for most people with this or with most other topics, you don't necessarily have a personal experience with it. So you are dependent on the media to kind of cover this, right? And so the way in which they choose to frame the story, right, is going to change the way that people interpret this. You are in violation of my constitutional rights. Across the country, tense moments caught on camera as more businesses enforce new rules to stop the spread of the virus. This customer at a Miami Beach Publix went on an explicit rant after being denied entrance for not wearing a mask. I'm filing a lawsuit. And what about mask wearing? Does that signify where on the political spectrum you fall? For some people, I'm sure it is kind of a political signal. But, you know, most people are are actually kind of complying with those requests and they're, you know, more or less wearing masks. And so I walk around Philadelphia most days and most of the people I see are wearing a mask. I wish more people would use it to cover their nose, but um, I guess better, better something than nothing. But, you know, I think if we, you know, look kind of broadly, a lot of the danger that we're seeing now is more coming from people who want to get back to quote unquote normal life, right? They want to be going to restaurants and bars and those things, maybe especially young people. So I I think that this is something where for most people, this isn't necessarily a political thing where their political views are driving this, right? I think maybe part of the issue too is also um, political leaders who are trying to let people go back to normalcy, maybe on a speed that's not quite, we're not quite ready for. 
No justice. No peace. No justice. No peace. No racist. Police. No racist. Police. What was his name? George Floyd. What was his name? George Floyd. The protests of summer 2020 echo the civil rights protests that took place in the middle of the 20th century. Mary Frances Berry, Geraldine Siegel, Professor of American Social Thought and Professor of History and Africana Studies, takes us to that moment in time. The modern civil rights movement, which we usually talk about starting in the 1950s and 60s, and the pressure that was brought to bear through nonviolent protest caused the um, enactment of the civil rights laws. But what caused the protest (laughs) was the continued racial conflict that existed in the South in particular, uh, because the movement was in the South at first until it moved North later. And it was a continued conflict, the segregation that had existed for a long time and the inequality as well as people not having the right to vote and being prohibited from voting, even though the 15th Amendment, uh, supposedly to the Constitution, had made it clear that the right to vote should not be interfered with because of race, uh, previous condition of servitude and national origin. But there were complaints about this. The Justice Department had received complaints for years from people in the South about police violence, about voting, about all these issues. Protests began in the South in the mid-1950s and continued through the 1960s. There was a lot of opposition. Some people were killed, some people were put in jail, put in prison, and it grew, the protests grew. And then eventually they asked that the national government pass a new civil rights law, and John Kennedy was president, didn't take it all seriously at first. He said, um, and I found this in his papers when I was researching one of the books I did, that this movement is going to go away. It's not going to last. These things always fizzle out. Uh, And he was right most of the time. (laughs) And he said, what? And Bobby Kennedy agreed with him. But then in Mississippi, James Meredith tried to get into Ole Miss and violence broke out there. And the president uh, had to uh, intervene, and he made a speech. And he took it seriously after that. Um, And eventually, he supported a new civil rights bill to be passed, he hoped, in 1963. And the March on Washington took place in 1963, August 28th, in Washington, D.C., the March for Jobs and Freedom, which Martin Luther King and others uh, spoke at. And it was to give impetus to getting another mode of nonviolent protest to give impetus to passing this legislation. A series of civil rights laws was passed that gave federal protection to voting rights, employment opportunity, and equal housing. But laws are one thing. Actions are another. The law is, as I teach my students, it's one thing to have law written down and get bills passed and all that. But if you don't enforce it, it doesn't make any difference. (laughs) You might as well not have it. I mean, it's a cautionary tale and it's rhetoric and it's symbolic. And over the years since that time, when students ask me if these laws were all passed, and I was asked that again yesterday by my students, if these laws all got passed, why didn't they end discrimination? And why do we still have it? (laughs) And Why are we still talking about white supremacy and gender discrimination and all these different things if, in fact, these laws passed? (laughs) Whatever happened to (laughs) to the laws? And that's because the executive branch of the government is responsible for seeing that the laws are faithfully executed. The Justice Department is at the forefront of that, and the agencies have some responsibility. And depending on who was in office politically, and what their base wanted or didn't want, you would get weak enforcement. As a matter of fact, no one was really really willing to go all out. (laughs) Uh, When Lyndon Johnson was president and the commissioner of education at that time tried to cut off the money from Chicago public schools because they kept on being segregated, 
uh, the Chicago politicians got in touch with the president and the president told the Commissioner of Education, no, <laughs> you find some other way to do it. Um, whatever happens, there are provisions that you can cut off contracts, federal contracts, to institutions that discriminate on the basis of sex, race, religion, national origin, and so on. But in the times when that's been attempted, the political forces, no matter who's around, have usually says, no, you're going to end up harming. The argument is that while those provisions are there and they have some, make symbolic sense, you will harm the institution for everybody who's there if you cut off the money. Professor Barry, a former chair of the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights, says that people need to be socialized to want change and the protests need to continue. I think that the way you get change, period, is by, as the people in the civil rights movement saw, and the people in the gun rights movement are seeing, <laughs> and the people in the climate change movement are seeing, is the way you get change is by uh, disruption and by making your voice known and heard. You can vote, but you also need to do all these other things, and you have to be persistent, and you have to keep it up. If you want to make change, you cannot rely on policies by them. They don't implement themselves. <laughs> the Constitution doesn't implement itself. <laughs> Looking at the intersection of racial justice and the coronavirus, Barry has a warning. COVID, the virus, the real question is, what will we do afterwards? We know that historically, what happened after a pandemic was that people went back to relating to each other, seeing each other. People like other people, so they like to, <laughs> they don't like to be isolated. So they started doing community uh, again, it was the, uh, the word of the day. That racial injustice has been seen during the virus, the pandemic. We've seen enough of that, and we know about the disparities and all that. And the question is, will what happened make us change policies? Like, will we decide we need national health care? I don't think so, but it would be a logical conclusion <laughs> given the disparities that have occurred here. What will we do about the economy? Is unemployment insurance enough of a protector for people when they're going through an economic crisis caused by something which is beyond their control? Uh, all of these questions will be uh, asked after it is over, how long it lasts will determine whether or not we change direction completely in some way, or whether we just pick up, you know, pretty much where we left off, which is what has happened with the earlier pandemics. So what's next? That's a question Bethany Wigan has been pondering. I, I have been wrestling with that question about whether there will be a new normal for a really long time. And interestingly, the very first group of environmental humanities student fellows who we had, they wrote in a manifesto that they found their work in shaping a new normal, that they wanted to really push hard on what it was to be normal. And I've been thinking about that phrase. Um, you know, it's a troubling phrase on so many levels because you don't want to think that a crisis is normal. But of course, the climate crisis is stretching on. Uh, warning after warning uh, has been issued by the IPCC, by Al Gore, by any number of brilliant activists, by Greta Thunberg, by the kids increasingly who are taking leadership on this crisis. Professor Wiggin is an associate professor of German and the founding director of the Penn Program in Environmental Humanities, or PPEH, a research organization that emphasizes collaboration across disciplines, community engagement, and environmental justice. As a parent, as well as a teacher, I really wrestle with this question of, do we educate our children into an understanding that this is a new normal, like just get used to it. There's going to be more wildfires. There's going to be more extreme weather. There's going to be more pandemic. This is normal. Or do we say, no, this isn't normal. This is a terrible 
aberration from normality and therefore it's intended upon us to work to create a different all. She sees connections between the way COVID regulations have played out and the environmental crisis. Recently, I've been thinking one intersection has to do with the way that the public health crisis that is presented by COVID impinges upon what many Americans consider to be their freedom of wearing a mask. If you think about shared responsibility for a healthy environment, shared responsibility for a healthy public health environment, it curtails the autonomous nature of how Americans have long defined freedom, what it means to be free in a liberal sense, in a philosophically liberal tradition. And I think the climate crisis is like that as well. I mean, that's why, you know, people hate regulation. They don't, <laughs> they don't want to restrict carbon emissions because we're free to do what we want to do. Um, but then both crises have reminded us, of course, that we are not free from our environments, whether it's considered to be the public health, medical environment, or the ecological environment. We are products of, of those environments, but we are also producers of those environments. And so our actions have vast repercussions for other humans, uh, but of course, other species. The stakes are high right now. The future is unknown. There's so much um, research and anecdotal reporting on young people and older people and climate scientists in particular suffering. Uh, it's not clear whether it's post-traumatic stress disorder or pre-traumatic stress disorder, actually. But at any rate, like a kind of broad array of eco-anxieties. And I think um, that will be something that as educators, as citizens of the world, uh, as members of a community of care, we're going to have to deal with those anxieties more and more frequently, whether we deal with them by acknowledging that we're in a crisis or by advocating and working for a new normal, for a Green New Deal, it's, I think, probably all approaches are welcome. They pose uh, real difficulties, I think, both intellectually as, as well as emotionally. Part of PPH's work is to get people to recognize climate change in their own lives. Their project, My Climate Story, encourages people to document the changes they've witnessed. Professor Wiggins spoke to us from Maine, where she grew up. Famously, the water is very cold. And I told a climate story about how, as a child, I could be in the water for a short amount of time and then my lips would turn blue. My parents would haul me out of the water. And in the summer of 2019, the water was so warm that we could actually swim for pretty easily a half an hour. I mean, it was still chilly, but it wasn't like blue, like you couldn't feel your feet anymore. Those changes are accelerating this summer even further. And it's the summer of 2020 in the waters of the northern part of the Gulf of Maine. It's historically been far too cold for great white sharks. There's been several uh, fatal uh, great white attacks very close by, actually. And the species are migrating. Um, the water is warming at the same time that oceans are acidifying. Uh, oceans are, are changing really right before our eyes, like you can feel it <laughs> when you're swimming um, and you see it in the species that are with you in the water. Um, lobsters are migrating further and further north. Friends of mine who are lobster men and women are really wondering about how much longer they're going to be able to make their livelihood fishing these grounds. If there is hope here, Professor Wiggins sees it in her students. So students in my classes and the research students who I am so lucky and love to work with and, and mentor, they really see the climate crisis as part of much wider intersecting set of crises that absolutely and fundamentally have to do with racial inequality, with long histories of racialized capitalism. For the students who I work with, they don't see the climate crisis crisis as subject solely to a techno fix. It's, it, those are necessary, but they're not 
enough. They're not sufficient because the roots of the problem are so, or the problems are so vexed that the students really see a much larger set of questions, larger set of problems whose solutions lie in a real kind of reform of relations with humans and relations with the more than human world as well. And the work that students make and the types of um, research they find so meaningful really works to promote wider communities of care. This wraps up the third episode in our six-part series, In These Times. We'll be back with episode four, Exacerbating Inequality, part one, where we look at how COVID-19 has shined a spotlight on disparities in the U.S. healthcare system. We'll talk with a sociologist and lawyer, a political scientist, and a doctoral student who's writing a history of the cystic fibrosis community. In These Times is a production of Penn Arts and Sciences. Special thanks to professors Matthew Lewandowski, Mary Frances Berry, and Bethany Wigan. I'm Alex Schein. Thanks for listening. Be sure to subscribe to the Omnia Podcast by Penn Arts and Sciences on Apple iTunes or wherever you listen to your podcasts to listen to all six episodes of In These Times.